Welcome to the channel, friends. So today's video is going to be something different for a change. I'm going to be updating you guys on what's going on with the ZR1 Corvette. I'm going to start including more content with the car build since I'm doing this over the winter time. I will be posting my normal ATV and snowblower videos uh, coming up soon. I have a whole bunch planned. So, but I want to include this because a lot of people have been asking me what's going on with the Corvette. They want to see more of the Corvette. So here it is. I'm going to show you guys kind of a quick update so far with the engine build and what's going on. So as you can see here, actually before I start telling you guys what's the current mods, let me step back and tell you what the previous mods were, which I did last year. So last winter, I took the car apart and did smaller pulley, a two, three, five pulley, uh, two inch Cook's headers, Cook's X pipe, and still have a stock axle back. I also did a larger Nick Williams 102 throttle body, and I had the K&N intake um, for a few years now. So that's that carbon fiber intake um, that's offered. That's like $900. So that going into the Nick Williams. Then I also had the ID 1050 X injectors. I also ported out the factory snout to 106 millimeters. So that whole setup, when I got it tuned, uh, I made 724 711 torque that's the uncorrected number and the corrected number for SAE is 700 rear wheel horsepower uh, 687 torque or something so the car put down 700 plus horsepower uh, as an actual on the day that I got it tuned which was like 32 degrees believe it or not it was a perfect day uh, but the actual output that day on the dyno was 724 711 so as you can see here I have the heads off and the supercharger off so that means I'm going to be doing more work porting wise to both of those, getting the heads ported and getting the supercharger ported. I will be doing most of the work myself, but I will be sending the heads out. I haven't decided which company yet. It's either Lingenfelter or K-Tech. So as you can see here, I'm going to go ahead and also replace the, uh, the lifters with Johnson lifters most likely and uh, replace the trays, you know, do the whole thing nice, replace everything with ARP bolts. I have a whole bunch of parts in the other room in the workshop. I'll show you when just a moment uh, what I'm going to use for the build. So uh, hopefully with the heads cam ported, you know, with a smaller pulley, which I plan on using, I should get at least 850 rear wheel horsepower. Okay, maybe more. I will be doing uh, a flex fuel sensor on this. So I will be upgrading to E85 in the short future, so I will have to run the ID 1300s uh, for injectors. So I have to step up in injector size, even though I really don't want to. Those uh, injectors I just put in were brand new. Uh, it seems like I'm replacing a whole bunch of brand new parts that I just put in last year. So um, I want to do the car right, so I'm going to step up and do everything right. I have the K-Tech C5R timing chain. Comp cams timing set uh, with hex adjust that way I can dial in that camshaft perfectly. I will be doing most of the engine work myself and then obviously getting it tuned at Performance Dyno in Loudoun, New Hampshire. So really happy to, to see this apart and to see some progress. So let me show you what I have going on in the workshop. Here is the tool cart. So here is the supercharger. We have a 235 pulley, a ported 106 millimeter factory snout. I will be going with either a Lingenfelter ported or a Kong ported snout. I haven't decided yet. So I have another snout um, if I plan on going with a Kong because you have to provide them a factory snout, not the Lingenfelter. Because what they do is they kind of cut this off and then they, they braze on or they weld on a larger throat and larger flange so you can use larger throttle bodies. So there's a couple issues that I want to talk about in this video that I noticed once I took apart the heads. Um, most of you people might know about this issue, but let's just kind of go over what I have here first and then I'm going to get into those issues that I'm talking about, which will be uh, corrected and fixed for the future. But anyways, here is a stainless steel 2.5 175 grip tech pulley. I will be running the factory um, supercharger lid, but I do have the Kong HD bricks, which are heavy duty 
rated for higher PSI. So here's the current valve train. That's the stock parts, stock bolts. Also, let's work our way over here. I'll show you what I have. Um, more parts. I run the Mighty Mouse catch can. I have the Kenny Bell booster pump I will be putting in and the Kong airfoil and divider set, which is just beautiful. I run the uh, Granatelli zero ohm wires, NGK iridium plugs, uh, factory ignition coils, and I have the 160 thermostat this time around. So just a bunch of random parts around the shop here. Um, let's see what else is going on. So let's get to the issues that I was talking about. So I noticed that once you have everything apart, you can see that there's oil in the runners. Oil in the intake runner and kind of, you know, oil where there shouldn't be, like up in the lid. There's a lot of it and it's kind of concerning. So what is happening is probably the seals are bad in combination with the guides being bad. Uh, I know the guides are bad because uh, I'm going to show you guys how much wiggle I have. Now these are just loose. They're hitting the, the bottom of the cardboard here, but they're dropping and there's a ton of wiggle in some of them. Most of the intake ones have a bunch of wiggle in any direction. So I'm going to try to measure that with an indicator and show you guys what uh, kind of like, you know, kind of what kind of numbers I get out of the valves when I put an indicator up to them. But they have some wiggle and it's kind of it's kind of unnerving, you know, to know that this this car has that dreaded valve guide issue. Uh, the valve guides are worn. They're the factory powdered guides. So that's something I have to address right now because I do not want to drop a valve or anything. So they all have some kind of wiggle in them, some more than others. This one right here being the worst one. I mean, look at that. You can hear it. Doesn't matter if you have it closed or open a little bit. There is a ton of wiggle in any direction. So I will do a setup on the surface plate with the indicator and try to get some good numbers and uh, set this thing up so I can kind of show you guys what valve guide wear looks like. And yes, it happens to LS9 heads. Um, you definitely want to take care of this when you have the heads off. So when it comes to worn out valve guides, there's a couple different, um, you know, schools of thought. Some people are saying just stick with the, the OEM guide material, which is a powdered metal, which is harder uh, than anything else. Uh, or go bronze guide. But bronze guides, um, they, they open up their own kind of, you know, they're good. They're better than the factory ones when it comes to lubricity and just... When they're done right, they can last a long time. But the problem is you have to use uh, roller tip rockers if you go with the bronze guides. Uh, it just, you know, there's too much side loading in the stock LS rocker arm design. And if you notice, like the intake rocker arm is offset. So, well, that causes side loading. So what happens if you're side loading the valve, you're putting pressure on that guide in a, in a weird direction. So you're, you're put, putting pressure forward and back because the stock LS rocker arm scrubs versus rolls, okay? That's just the nature of the stock rocker arm. But if you get a roller tip, it actually prevents that action and it's more smooth of a, of a kind of a mechanism when it rolls up and down on the top of the, the valve stem. So there's two ways of approaching this. So like I said before, I'm gonna get it ported. So if I go porting with Lingenfelter, they recommend installing the factory OEM guides, which are the powdered metal. If I go K-Tech, they recommend using the bronze guides. But like I said, go, using bronze guides opens up a higher cost because now you have to have special titanium valves that are molly coated and you cannot use um, the factory ones according to K-Tech. You have to use their own molly coated ones. So that alone is a $1,600 add-on, just the valves, the titanium valves. So I'm not sure what I want to do yet. I still have to decide. It's either going to be K-Tech or Lingenfelter. Um, I'm leaning towards the bronze guides, being that I don't want to replicate the factory situation. So if I replace this with OEM guides, right, run OEM rockers, I'm going to replicate the same kind of wear that I have right here. That's my issue. 
if I want to change things up and try to improve them, I have to stay away from the factory material and the factory kind of setup. The LS rocker arms, don't get me wrong, they are a lightweight, awesome rocker arm. But the problem is the geometry just is terrible. You have an offset rocker, you have a scrubbing action versus a nice smooth rolling action. Uh, it's just, they're, the only thing good about them is that they're lightweight and strong. That's it. Um, if you use uh, the factory rockers with bronze guides, you're going to be in trouble. It's going to beat the hell out of those guides because bronze is softer. And if the, uh, the alignment is not correct, that's when you're going to have some severe issues. So the valve train geometry is very important. Uh, I'm not, like I said, I'm, I'm still deciding what I want to do. It's either going to be K-Tech or Lingenfalter for sure. So I will keep you guys posted on what uh, comes from that and what I decide. Uh, I will try to kind of keep the cost down because this is expensive enough when it comes to modifying an engine head's cam, you know, smaller pulley, you know, larger injectors. It's It all adds up. So, uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention this is the cam right here. I got the factory head gaskets, a whole bunch of stuff, ARP bolts. Uh, this is the Brian Tooley Stage 4. I got the Super Damper ARP head bolts, more comp cam stuff. I have a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, and I will be getting it done soon, hopefully, uh, while I wait for the heads to be ported. So I think I covered the topics that I want to cover. Uh, one being, well, the main one being the, uh, the amount of wiggle in these valves. So I will do the setup and, and show you guys what that looks like. But uh, I have to address that right now because it's very important for me to get these heads right. Uh, I want to get some good flow. And when I get something that's going to be um, high performance and, and be reliable for the most part. So I'm leaning towards the bronze guides, even though I know I might have to take it apart late, you know, down the road, say 20,000 miles, 30,000 miles and replace them again. That's okay with me. If I can get something that's going to, you know, be higher performance and offer less uh, friction in the valve train, um, I'm all for it. So uh, I will decide on that and I'll give you guys a video when everything comes back and show you the heads when they're ported and what they look like. And then I'll set it back up and I'll show you guys what the amount of wiggle is on a brand new set of guides that have been fitted, reamed and honed. So I'm gonna go ahead now and get the setup ready on the surface plate and show you guys the amount of wiggle on my factory heads. All right, so here is the setup I came up with. I have the cylinder head clamped down to the surface plate. Uh, the surface plate, if you don't know what it is, it's just a calibrated surface to take uh, very accurate measurements off of. And then I have my Mitotoyo 50 millionths digital indicator set up here with my Noga adjustable magnetic base. That way I can slide that thing around. And what I'm going to do is go to each valve stem and show you one cylinder head because the other cylinder head is the same exact thing. So I have my indicator set up perpendicular to the valve stem. That way I can get a measurement without cosine error. So if, if you're at an angle on that point, on the peak of that valve stem, if you're tilted with that stem on the indicator, you're going to get something called cosine error, which is going to make your numbers larger than they, they really should be. We just want to go with the movement of the wiggle. So we want to be perpendicular to that movement or perpendicular to the valve stem. Um, that's going to give you your most accurate readings. So with the indicator set up like this, I have a hundred thousandths of travel into the indicator, which means I'm putting a little more spring pressure on the stem itself, which is going to give me a better zero because what I want to do is push the valve to one side and then I'm going to push it the other way with my fingers and show you that sweep, that wiggle that I have here on the, on each stem. So that's going to be able to do that in a more like, you know, functional manner. So a hundred thousandths into the travel, then I zero, and then I can go ahead and, and do a little wiggle test. And I will do that for each one of these. Uh, I'm not going to do the other cylinder head because obviously it's the same situation that I'm in. I'm on center line, so I want to be kind of dead nuts on the valve stem. You know, that way you take a good accurate measurement. So with that being said, that is uh, the rundown of how I'm setting up my indicator and how I plan on measuring it. Now, this is a great setup because it's something I can do in the workshop. Uh, but if I were in a real machine shop or, you know, a high-end place, uh, you would want to measure the guide with either 
a bore gauge, a intramic, or a pin gauge, like a Deltronic pin. Uh, that's the, the real way of measuring inside diameters. Um, what's happening with the guide here, because of the wear, you're going to have an hourglass shape in the guide. So in order to measure that accurately inside the guide, you have to use some kind of telescoping gauge that you insert inside the uh, guide and then expand it and measure the inside diameter. That will give you a true reading on how worn out the guide is. But this will essentially tell you uh, what it is. And when I compare it to the heads when they come back from being ported and having new guides in, I'll do the same exact test that you see here and I'll see what kind of play I have at the same location. I'm just under the radius groove, about a hundred thousandths, so that's exactly where we're going to be testing it. It doesn't matter exactly the location because what we're doing is we're zeroing out the indicator and then we're going to measure that, that play right in the same spot. So essentially it's a very good um, method on measuring the valve guide wear. So. Like I said, if I wish I had a set of intra mics, but you know, I'm not in a machine shop right now, I'm at home, so this is the best setup I could come up with. So let me get started and I'll show you exactly the process uh, from each stem and uh, see what kind of results we get. So we want to add up the total indicator reading. So what I'm talking about is that we're going to get a number one way, and then when I move it the other way, we'll get another number. So we have to add both of the numbers up to get a total indicator reading, or a TIR. So only touching the valve stem, it's not going any further the other way. And then we have 3.8, so that's 3 thousandths, 8 tenths on the first valve. So we let it loose. Same thing. Now I'm only using like finger pressure. Uh, your rocker arms are going to use a lot more force than my fingers so uh, that number is going to be more drastic with the more amount of load on it. So I'm just, I don't want to move the head at all so I'm just going to go really carefully on each of the valve stems so I don't move it. So you get the idea. That's the full indicator reading from them that point there to there. So we have about, you know, three thou nine tenths, something like that. This is a very sensitive indicator. So uh, don't worry about the last digit there, the fifth decimal place over, uh, that's 50 millionths. Uh, just focus on the third one and the fourth one. So just for the record, this is the driver's side cylinder head. I'm gonna now pull up on this to see what kind of reading we get. So this is in the closed position. The numbers get a little bit better when it's in the closed position. But in the open position, just so it hits the bottom of the surface plate here, uh, it's probably about 200 thousandths of lift, say. It's not dropping that far. Uh, we're getting just under 4 thousandths. When you add up your total indicator reading, just with finger pressure, that's what we get. So moving on to the next one. Wow. Twelve thousandths? More than that. We have twelve thousandths plus that. Fourteen, fifteen thousandths in that one. That's the worst one. Oof. Wow. That is terrible. Okay, I'm going to pull it up so it's in a closed position. One way is about ten thousandths. Other way, about two and a half or so. So still, still about ten thousandths, twelve thousandths. That is crazy.
about 12 thousandths on that one, you know, give or take. That's a lot of play. That's in the closed position. The more I can crank on it more, I just don't want to move the cylinder head. So let's move on. So one way, so we have it in the lowered position right now, about three thousandths, three thousandths, three and a half, so six and a half thousandths, that one's not too bad. I'm going to raise it up into the closed position, about three thousandths. Okay, next one. zoom in it is in the lowered position in the open position we have about almost six thousandths in the closed position Yeah, like five. So. so that total indicated reading is what we're after. We have that one number this way and then the one number that way doing the wiggle test. We add both of those numbers up and that will give us um, the number we're looking for. We're trying to quantify the, t the actual test. So we need to figure out what that number is and then, like I said, compare it to the new heads when they come back. So that's, that's about five, six thousandths. Yeah. And moving on. I have to re-zero every time because I'm picking up a new center line or the peak of that, that stem. I want to be right on the center. And then hit zero. So we're in the open position. Two seven one four. So we're about four thousandths there. In the close position, two four plus eight tenths, five two millions. Okay. So like three just over three thousandths on that when it's closed. Don't worry about if it's like, you know, a tenth off, you know, we're getting the reading we need um, by measuring in thousands and uh, anything after that in tens of thousands of an inch um, is just that little more resolution. But essentially you could do this with a one thousandth indicator um, like most people have. This is just a you know, much more accurate indicator and it gives you more resolution, um, but it jumps around a lot because like I said, it's very sensitive. So next one, we're in the closed position. This is a titanium intake valve. So one way is four, four, six, eight. That's a lot. <laughs> That's over 10 thousandths of, of play there. So we're in the closed position now. One side is three thousandths. 
The other side's another 3,000. So 6,000 is when it's closed. The intake ones seem like they have a little more play than the exhaust for whatever reason. Uh, it might have to do with the geometry of the LS rocker, which is an offset rocker. It's side loading. So people want to say all sorts of good things about the LS rockers. I mean, I understand they're great rockers because they're lightweight, but that's all they have. They're lightweight and strong. And um, the geometry honestly sucks, to be honest. Okay, so now we're gonna zero. This is another exhaust valve. We're in the open position, about 200 thousandths. And we have about one thou there and three thou there. So four thou when it's open. When you pull it up in the closed position, we have one three and just under one thou there. So just over like almost two and a half thou on that one. When it's closed which is not bad and that's the exhaust so you also can do the same measurement on the side to side travel which is also present in these valves I'm only doing this direction here because it's easy for me to pick up with the indicator uh, these valves also wiggle the other way so side to side um, they all do that the thing is the rocker arm is scrubbing across it in one direction um, but the intake has a, a different situation where it's being scrubbed back and forth to operate and it's also side loading so it's putting pressure into the corner of that um, that, that guide if you want to call it a corner uh, but it's not pushing it straight back you know forward and back it's pushing it off to the side it's, it's causing um, a weird load angle on the wear guide Very last one's going to be an intake. It's in the open position right now. About five thousandths plus three. So about eight thousandths there. Closed, we have four thousandths one way and three thousandths the other. So seven thousandths. So that right there is what I get for one cylinder head. It's the same situation on the other. Um, I'm noticing. The intake valves, the guides are worn out more than the exhaust. That's just a, a common uh, thread that I'm seeing here. Like, All right, guys, so that is the conclusion of the test. I got my numbers. Uh, we know what the head is in a worn out condition. Uh, when I get the new head, like I said, I've, I'll do the same exact setup and I'll see what I get for numbers and what kind of uh, wiggle we have um, at the valve stem. So with that being said, I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you have any questions or comments, please place them right down below. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please go ahead and do so. I want to thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.